It's Brian Preston, the money guy. So let's talk about dollar cost averaging. Oh, this is another yep. tool that I think is so powerful because why do we even talk about dollar? We talk about dollar cost averaging, whether we're in good markets, bad markets, normal markets, it doesn't matter, but they're especially powerful in a, a very crisis-driven market because there's so many irrational things going on. The news media is freaking you out. Your relatives are freaking you out. You know, everybody it seems like you talk to is panicking about what's going on. And you're like, well, should I should I stop? Should I not buy anything else yep. in the future? Is this the right time to buy? Was last week the right time to buy? Here's what we have a tool that will help you know the right answer. So again, let's go back to just textbook definition here. What is dollar cost averaging? Well, dollar cost averaging is an investment strategy that involves regularly and systematically investing into the market often every month or every year. So it's systematically entering money into the markets on a, on a regular basis. Now, one of the most easy, common, most familiar ways that every person can think about this is when you're investing in your employer-sponsored retirement plan, whether that be a 401k or 403b or 457 or, or simple IRA, those contributions, those payroll contributions you're doing are a perfect example of dollar cost averaging in practice. Yeah. And the only thing, and this is another thing I want to, since this is, takes the emotion out of it, makes it a systematic process. Think about people, we've done episodes where we're trying to figure out dollar cost averaging versus lump sum investing. Yep. You sell a business, you sell a piece of real estate, you know, you come into a big chunk, you're trying to figure out if you have a seven figure payment that has come to you and you're trying to figure out, do I put it all in at once or do I spread it out over a period of time? Guys, this downturn is a perfect example. We've shown you this in a lot of research. Between 10 to 12 months, you don't gut your long-term mm -hmm. performance, but man, can you mitigate some major risk if you do spread that money out over time? Because think about somebody who comes into a million, a, a seven-figure portfolio sure. right now, a windfall. If you'd put that money in three weeks ago, Mm -mm. And then watched, I mean, even a diversified portfolio potentially probably could be down 15 to 20%. Yep. An undiversified, meaning all risk assets, would be down easily 30 to 35%. Yep. You would be disgusted. However, if you were buying this over a period of time, like I said, we typically, the research shows 10 to 12 months is not going to gut the long-term performance because there's only a few percent difference. Sure in the research that Vanguard and others have done, but still it protects you. And all of our clients, because we do have some that are lump sum investing. And as a matter of fact, I had a call about two weeks ago with a client. We were buying into this downturn and he, was, he called me that morning. He goes, hey, I know we're slated to buy this morning. Can we can we cut it off today and just wait a few more weeks? And I was like, like no, 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 you're missing it. <laughs> that is not how systematic dollar cost averaging works. We are just consistently buying all the way through the process. That way you're, you're taking advantage of the drive through it mentality that I've already talked yep. about, but you're also taking the emotions out of the process. So just how powerful can this be? Again, we thought maybe this would be valuable for us to look at a case study, yep. an example of how powerful it can be. So we went and looked. Uh, and we decided, let's not just go back to the Great Recession, 2008. Let's go even back to the big one, to the big, nasty, dirty one, the Great Depression. Yep. What does that look like? And this is what we know. If you look at the Dow, the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, it closed at $381 on September 3rd of 1929. Well, if you fast forward 25 years into the future, on November 23rd of 1954, it closed at $383. So it what a horrible went up time to $2 an in 25 years. That is a horror. I mean, this is one of those things where you're like, oh my goodness, we've gone 25 years. I've made absolutely nothing except for the dividends, the interest that sure. might be on my portfolio. That is a horrible time to be an investor. Or is it? Or is it? So we said, what if we took a hypothetical $10,000 and we just invested it every single year beginning on September 1st, 1929, all the way through November 1st, 1954. So essentially, we would be investing $260,000 over that time period. Again, if you took 260 and just invested on 1929, it would have been worth a little bit more than 260 in 1954 if you did a lump sum. But if you were to perpetrate this $10,000 per year dollar cost averaging stat, drive through it, drive through it, uh, and you assume that we just let the dividends reinvest each year. What you would have found is at the end of this 25-year period, the $260,000 investment compounded to a value of one and a half 
$1.2 million or an 11.7% annualized rate of return. Guys, keep investing. Take the emotions out of it. Dollar cost averaging can definitely be your friend. Um, and that, that leads to number four. This is, I always like to tell people, a lot of us will have portfolios that it looks like a quilt. You're like, how did I get here? You know, you have a retirement plan here and so forth. And it's not uncommon. It's not uncommon that you'll have some, maybe grandparents gave you a, mm-hmm. an individual stock. You have a mutual fund that you bought, but it actually did okay pretty sure. well. So you had an embedded gain that you didn't want to go generate taxes. And it was it was not a great investment, but it was good enough that you didn't want to go s- generate a yep. lot of taxes by selling it. A lot of your legacy holdings that you're kind of stuck with this is a great time to reevaluate because usually you can get away from worrying about the taxes as much. The impact is much smaller. So we are telling people, if you have individual stocks or mutual funds that no longer kind of fit into your model and you, you know, and now taxes are no longer a big issue, this is the time to take action. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, one of the things that we believe in is whenever it comes to portfolio design and construction, whenever like a new potential client comes to us, we don't believe in apple cart turnover. We just sell everything and buy all new stuff that we would prefer. Right. We actually analyze the current portfolio. Well, one of the things we do find is that a lot of clients have those legacy positions. This is a great opportunity to either harvest losses in those or even do gain matching, where you sell enough losses to offset the gains, to have a net neutral trade. It's a great opportunity to be doing that. So go. we're not saying go to cash, but we are saying make sure you're looking at your portfolio and seeing if this isn't a great time to prune some of the older stuff you don't necessarily love anymore to make better use of it for the future. Yep. So number five. Turbocharge paying yourself first. What do I mean by this? Turbocharging paying yourself first is we tell you, we want you to have a cash management plan where every month you are investing to grow your invest- investments for the future. Well, a lot of us are now working from home. Mm-hmm. Our, our ex- daily, our monthly expenses are down right now. Now look, there's a lot of people that are hurting. Sure. Hospitality industry, other things. That, that Not necessarily talking to them, but I'm talking about there are people that they're, they're Their expenses have gone down. They've got this situation where they're trying to figure out what should I be doing behaviorally or Mm -hmm. financially to maximize. I'm telling you, even for myself, I was on a pay down my mortgage as fast as I could. I'm in my late 40s. Mm -hmm. I want to be debt free, but I'm in my early 50s completely, and that mortgage is the only debt I have. So I was hyper accelerating what I was paying down. I recognize valuations of the financial markets are way down. This is that once every few, few years bear market that Mm -hmm. comes our way once a decade. So I have once again repositioned where I'm no longer hyper paying down that low interest 3.5% mortgage. I'm now putting that money into my dollar cost averaging strategy. So that's why I'm saying, if you can look at your financial situation and you have the extra margin, the extra capacity, because go put it to work. This is the opportunity to kind of squeeze paying yourself first to maximize what you can do for the future. Now, I want to make sure that I heard what you did say, and what, and then I want to make sure I heard what you did not say. Yeah. You did not say, hey, what I recognize is there was this once a decade opportunity, and so I went and took my three months emergency reserves yeah. or my six months emergency reserves, and I went and decided to plow that into the market and get it working for me. That's not what you said. You also didn't say, hey, I recognize that interest rates are at all time low. So I went and did a cash out refinance on my mortgage (laughs) and pulled the cash out and put it in the market. That's not what you said. You said, hey, I had this one strategy where I was employing dollars or for folks out there, maybe your expenses are down and there's extra money left over. It is accelerating your investment or taking advantage out of the margin, not stealing from the foundational things that you need in place to make sure that you have yourself covered if this thing gets No, scarier. you're a spot on. you got to have your emergency breaks. That's your cash reserves. They have a moat around them that you're not touching, that you're keeping those assets safe, liquid, so that way you can keep your financial life out of the ditch. But if you do have extra margin, extra capacity, it's, it's the whole Warren Buffett thing. Instead of pulling out a thimble, That's right. you're pulling out a wash tub exactly to go collect right. as much as you can of the opportunity. That's Love all it. we're saying is be opportunistic, but do not put your financial life in the ditch. Love it. Number six, rebalance. Oh, great opportunity. Right I now. mean, this is one of those things. Realize what happens in a declining financial market is that your equity assets, your risk on assets will get smaller. They'll get beat up, but your conservative assets, one more benefit to having diversification will probably stay steady, if not even go up a little bit. So your 
asset allocation might get a little out of wonk. Mm -hmm. I mean, because you're going to have risk assets are down, non-risk assets are doing okay. It might make sense to, from time to time, harvest losses and coordinate that with rebalancing so that you can make sure that you're taking advantage of this unique opportunity. Now, we've said this before, but it bears repeating. Rebalancing is exactly what you said, tweaking around the edges to get your allocation back to what it should have been. It is not completely changing your allocation. If you are a 80-20, rebalancing doesn't mean I go to a 100-0 or a 60-40. It's about getting back to where you should have been originally, not revamping the whole strategy. That's exactly right. You're not reactionary. That's right. You had a sound mind plan going into it. You're not reacting now. Love it. Number seven, Roth conversions. This is one that I think is great because while assets are down, you can convert more assets that, that are tax deferred, like your 401ks, your rollover IRAs, mm-hmm. and those type of things. While they're compressed, the opportunity built into those assets is even more so now to convert them so that when we get a recovery, the tax, the growth will be completely tax free. Sure. Now, hear me out on this. There's a tightrope that you have to walk. It's just like right now, I'm sad. Some of my clients, every year we do a Roth conversion, but we have to wait. For the end of the year to see, do a tax projection because you've got Social Security Mm -hmm. considerations. You've got Affordable Care Act consideration. You have Medicare premiums Mm -hmm. that are considerations. All these variables go into it. But that doesn't mean, for especially those clients that are between 50 to 72 years of age, if you know that there's a safe level of Roth conversion you can do that's not going to trigger any of those things that are income-based, you might want to consider it right now. It's not crazy. Now, here's the thing. Roth conversions, just like you said, you you can have a great idea that has a lot of unintended consequences you did not realize in terms of triggering taxability on Social Security and Medicare and all those things. It's a pretty, um, I don't want to say complicated, but it's an advanced strategy. If you're someone who's thinking about perpetrating that kind of strategy, it might not be a horrible idea to get a second opinion. Reach out to a financial advisor. Reach out to your tax preparer. Ask somebody who actually understands them, hey, is this what makes sense for me? Is this something I should consider doing? I want to close out this section with number eight. This is, this is, this is one of those finger-wagging old man on the porch <laughs> moments, and I don't mean to be that way, but there, I think it is important that we understand our behavior and what the terms mean. There is a huge difference between being an investor – versus a speculator. Oh, yeah. So an investor has a long-term plan. They're they're putting assets to work out in the market that they're forgetting for the next five to seven years. They have a long-term mindset. It's all part of a diversified plan. It, it takes into account cash flow, goals, risk profile, their age, your liquidity. All those things are built into it with a sound mind plan. Yep. A speculator sees that this stock that maybe is in your town or it's in a sector that you love or you heard that from a a, a brother-in-law that this stock was getting beaten up right now, a speculator tries to swoop in, take advantage of that super low price, and then, you know, make a little money, gamble a little bit. And I'm not even against you being a speculator, but with a very small percentage of your assets. I really wouldn't get crazy with more than 2 to 3% of your investable assets in speculative actions. I mean, we're even, I mean, we do this stuff yeah. literally for ourselves, but it's very small. Yep. If you look at our asset allocation, we are practicing what we preach, our long term assets. It's, just, it's so funny. I have a neighbor, best friend, that um, he's like, every year he calls me up because he, he loves the individual stock play. And he's like, Dad, gummit, if the SP didn't beat it again. He <laughs> goes, I, I, I keep, the, your voice rings in my ears every year when I do my annual analysis and I see how good the SP 500 did. Yep. And I'm like, that's because you're betting into the optimism of innovation, of a growing, successful economy. I know that looks dark and in and, and, and these hard times when markets are down, but it is an ever growing pizza pie that you are buying into a slice of. So take advantage of that. That's why we love broad diversification, not speculating and just trying to pick the next stock that you can make money off of. Now, what happens is, is when we ever get in the thick of the, the, these things, our mind can play tricks on us and it can convince us, oh, no, no, I'm not. I'm not speculating. I'm just a I'm just a smart investor, and I can see the trend, and I can see the thing. Here's the gut check you can always do to figure out if what you're doing is investing or if it's speculating. Whatever you're going to buy, or whatever allocation you're going to have, whatever you're going to whatever you're going to do, 
if you had to lock it up in a box for five to 10 years and not touch it, not be able to sell it, not be able to look at it, would you still do it? I'd make the argue if your answer is, oh, no, 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 I just, I want to be able to, I want to sell it when it pops, then you're speculating. Yeah. If you could put it in a black box and not touch it for a decade, that means you're probably a long-term investor thinking about it the right way. Yeah, because you got it right on the front end. That's so right. that's, those are all things that you can do right now to prepare yourself or, or, or make yourself better during this financial crisis. 